Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a travel agent and a school principal who is organising a school tour for a group of third-year students. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, McFadden's Travel. James speaking. How may I help you? Hi there. My name's Jonathan Presley, Principal of Sainsbury Secondary School. I am calling to ask about your early bird tour offer. I saw it advertised in the Evening Herald yesterday. Certainly, Mr Presley. What would you like to know? Oh, please. Jonathan will be fine. Of course, Jonathan. How can I help you? Well, the first thing I'd like to know is, how long is your offer valid for? My third-year students are planning a holiday in early April. Will they qualify for the discount? The good news is, our special offer runs until the end of May. Oh dear, oh dear, March. That's terrible. We've just missed out. On the contrary, Jonathan. It's May, not March. You will qualify for the discount. Oh, fantastic! And I'm only just getting started. The best news is yet to come. What do you mean? Well, tell me now, how many students are you planning to take on this tour? I expect there'll be about 45 students and three teachers accompanying them. Why? Are there any further discounts? There are indeed. We do a 25% discount on groups of up to 40 people. For you, we can offer an even better rate, a 50% discount. Wow! Is that on top of the 15% early bird discount? It most certainly is, which makes your total tour discount, um, 50 plus 15, 65%. Surely there's a catch. This is too good to be true. Well, there is a condition that you must choose your destination from a list we have selected. You can't book a tour to just anywhere in the world with this discount rate. I see. And would Madrid be on that list by any chance? Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we do not offer this rate on tours to Madrid. However, we have an excellent all-inclusive seven-day Barcelona tour which is available. How does that sound? Sounds interesting. What is the total cost per student? Let's see... It works out at £679 per person with the discount. The normal price is £1,940, so you are saving £1,261 per person. Hold on a moment. Let me get a pen to write some of this down. It's getting complicated. OK, how much will it cost per student? £679. And how much of a saving is that? £1,261. Barcelona sounds very good indeed. Uh, tell me, what do you mean by all-inclusive? What does £679 get us? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Well, that price covers flights, three-star hotel accommodation and extras. James, I must say I'm very glad I called you this morning. This is a fantastic deal. It covers flights, accommodation and what else? Plus airport taxis, breakfast every morning, a city tour and theatre tickets. Great! And what about the teachers? 
The teachers can travel free of charge with the students. Well, I might just go on this tour myself. I've always fancied a trip to Barcelona, <laughs> but uh, for the children's sake, of course. <laughs> of course. Now let's get to work on the booking. Exactly when were you planning to leave? The seventh of April, if possible. Yes, that's available. And can you confirm the exact number of students, please? It's either forty-four or forty-five.、Uh, let me see. Yes, forty-five. Exactly forty-five students. No, sorry.、Uh, in fact, that's forty-six. I forgot about Jenny McCarthy. She sent her application in late, so it's not in the same pile as the rest. So that's the seventh of April and forty-six students, correct? Yes, perfect. And three teachers. Is there a morning flight? Yes, your flight is at seven a.m. on Monday, the seventh of April. Arrive at the airport two hours before departure. The flight will take about two and a half hours, and you'll land at ten thirty a.m. local time. How does that sound? Sounds great. Can I give you my email address to confirm the rest of the details? Of course. It's Jonathan dot Presley at Sainsbury dot com. That's J O N A T H O N dot P R E S L E Y at S A I N S B U R Y dot com, and we'll pay by credit card if possible. That'll be perfect. What's your card number? It's six six seven six 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 five four nine seven four three one two five one. Expiry date: O one Jan two thousand and fifteen. And the name on the credit card? That's my own, Jonathan Presley. So six hundred and seventy-nine pounds times forty-six students.、Um... I'm going to charge thirty-one thousand two hundred thirty-four pounds to your credit card. That's the total cost. Sounds fine. Great. Well, I think that's all we need for now, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give me a call. We'll be in touch next week to confirm the booking details. Okay, and thank you very much for your help, James. Bye for now. Bye, bye, Jonathan. Speak soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the history of motor racing. First, you will have time to look at questions eleven and twelve. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven and twelve. Good morning and welcome to the program. This week we're continuing our series of features on motor racing, and I am delighted to welcome to the show David McWilliams, widely recognised as the most knowledgeable motor racing historian in England. We've invited David in to talk to us about what is probably the most famous and prestigious motor racing championship in existence today. That is, of course, Formula One. David, Formula One is now a massive racing franchise, but how did it all begin? Well,、uh, Formula One has its roots in the European Grand Prix Motor Racing Championship, which began in the 1920s. After World War II, the Grand Prix was transformed into a new championship format, 
the one we are familiar with today, Formula One. The formula stands for the rules which all the drivers and manufacturers must respect. The one signifies that this racing championship is regarded as the best in the world. The first world championship race was held in 1950 at Silverstone in England. It was won by Italian Giuseppe Farina in his Alfa Romeo. Farina narrowly beat his teammate Juan Manuel Fangio of Argentina to the title, yet it was Fangio who would go on to dominate the sport for the rest of the decade, winning five world championships. As the years went by, the sport became a global phenomenon and grew from strength to strength, becoming the biggest commercial sport on the planet. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. There's no doubt that Formula One is big business today, David. But what about the real heroes, the great drivers of Formula One, past and present? Who stands out as the best, in your opinion? That's an almost impossible question to answer, but I could narrow it down to three or four amazing drivers. Take your pick from any one of them. I'll start with the grandmaster of Formula One, the great Fangio, who I've already mentioned. He dominated the sport throughout the 1950s, winning five titles in all, his first in 1951, his last in 57, a record that stood for 46 years. Indeed, he was the first multiple championship winner. Fangio was a fiery and spirited Argentinian who never gave up. His greatest moment came in winning the 1957 championship when he came back from a disastrous pit stop to recover a 30-second deficit and take the championship on the last lap of the last race of the season. That was, of course, to be the last time he'd win the title. Another undoubted great is Brazilian Ayrton Senna. Senna won the world title three times, the first being in 1988, the last in 1991. Tragically, he died in a race crash the year after, to the dismay of millions of fans watching the race unfold live on TV. Senna was best known for his skills driving in the wet, and he won the Monaco Grand Prix on what is regarded as the most difficult race course in Formula One more times than any other driver. Perhaps because of this, he is regarded as the most naturally gifted driver to have ever sat behind the wheel. Another very talented driver was Frenchman Alain Prost. Prost won the driver's title four times during his career. His first title victory came in 1985 and his last arrived in 1993. Of course, Prost will always be remembered as the driver with the third highest number of championship victories and perhaps even more for the fact that he was a great rival of Ayrton Senna. Those two had many great battles. Last but not by any means least, Michael Schumacher is the most recent of these driving greats who deserves a mention. His first title was won in 1994, and he continued to dominate Formula One until he won his last title in 2004. Schumacher holds many driving records, including most drivers' championships, race victories, fastest laps, pole positions, points scored and most races won in a single season. He is also regarded as the greatest driver on paper, having won seven world titles. It sounds like Schumacher is in a league of his own. Is he not clearly the best then, David, based on his record? It's not that simple, unfortunately. These drivers all raced in different eras, with different cars and under different circumstances. I don't believe we can say one was the out-and-out -out best, but rather that each was the best of his time. That's praise enough. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear four business colleagues discussing a takeover proposal. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Pause the recording for thirty seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. So let's go over this again. We don't want to make any mistakes, and we all need to agree we're making the right decision. Absolutely, we'd have to spend a lot of money to buy Biz Educators Inc. Almost ten million pounds. So let's get this right, otherwise it'll be our necks on the line. Well, I for one think this is an excellent opportunity for our company to expand and break into a new market. I say we should go ahead with the takeover. At ten million pounds, Biz Educators is good value for money. Okay, Dave. I know you're very much in favour of the acquisition. How about you summarise the plus points of this venture for us? Mark, you're less certain, and you've highlighted some issues already. Will you summarise the downsides? I'd be only too happy to. Right then, Dave. Let's start with you. Why is this proposal so attractive? What are the upsides? It's simple economics. Biz Educators has a proven track record and is an industry leader. It is a well-respected company with a great name, has generated excellent goodwill, and has consistently made a gross profit of more than five hundred thousand pounds per annum with a great shareholder return. Yeah, but what about the net profit? That's not nearly as high. In fact, last year it made a net loss of a hundred thousand pounds. Mark, that's only because it invested in a new manufacturing plant. That's a long-term investment to secure the company's future. In fact, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. It shows that the company has a clear and ambitious strategy going forward. Besides, a one hundred thousand pound loss is very small in real terms. It's hardly worth being concerned about. That loss will be clawed back within two years if the projected profits for two thousand and twelve and two thousand and thirteen materialise. The forecast is for a net profit of five hundred thousand pounds in two thousand and twelve, and one million pounds in two thousand and thirteen. The figures speak for themselves. This is a sound investment. I have to agree with Dave. Why are you so sceptical, Mark? I see where Dave is coming from, but we're overlooking some vital facts. First of all, this company wants to remain an independent entity. Hostile takeover bids are fraught with danger. We know from experience. Remember Davidsville Inc. We spent a fortune researching that company and creating a workable business plan, only for the merger to fall through. Mark's right. It is always difficult to buy a company that doesn't want to be sold. Davidsville was a disaster. Continue, Mark. That's not my only concern. I'm also worried that Biz Educators is a production-based company. We have no experience running companies like that. Our market is investment banking and trading. We would have to hire outside managers to run Biz Educators for us. That's going to cost more money. Look, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying this is a high-risk venture. Plus, there's no synergy. Our business is totally different, so we can't save costs by combining departments. Well, we can certainly see that this decision is not straightforward by any means. Maybe, but we have to come to a conclusion soon. It's almost five o'clock. What's the hurry? Can't we postpone our decision and discuss the takeover proposal again tomorrow? Mark, have you forgotten that we have to have our conclusions ready for tomorrow's board meeting? That's when the official decision will be made. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Goodness, it almost slipped my mind. Well, we'd best move on. 
Mary, John, you were uncertain before. Now that you've listened to the pros and cons of the proposal, what do you think? I think it's a great opportunity for our business. Biz Educators is definitely profitable, and it is a business on the up. It's growing, and is a very attractive takeover proposition for that reason. No one doubts that it's a very successful business, but the question is, should we invest? I say we should, provided we can guarantee the following. First of all, I would like assurances that the management of Biz Educators won't oppose us outright. That would make the bid too difficult. Secondly, I think we need to ask an independent mediator to broker the deal on our behalf. Last time we tried to negotiate our own takeover. It was a disaster, as Mark said. I agree, Mary. I'd also like us to carry out another audit of the company's books.、Uh, in fairness, John, I don't think that's necessary. We've done a thorough audit already. It'll just cost more money. We must keep the deal secret until it goes through, though. If this gets leaked to the press, biz educators won't be happy. That will make the management even more hostile towards us. Good point. Agreed. I don't think we need to be concerned about projected profit margins, goodwill, or accounting issues. Biz Educators has kept very up-to-date account books. Great. Then we're all agreed. The takeover should go ahead, provided we proceed cautiously. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about conserving energy. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. I'd like you to give a warm welcome to our guest speaker today, Dr. Sophia Martin from the Faculty of Science. Dr. Martin is an expert in energy conservation, and she's going to talk to us about ways we can conserve energy in the home. This is a very important subject, as the world we live in is facing dramatic and potentially destructive climate change, as a result of our excessive wastefulness and aggressive exploitation of natural resources. Thank you for the kind words, Alice. You are quite right. We face an unprecedented climate crisis, and it is up to each and every one of us to do our bit to help stop global warming. Believe it or not, if we all took some simple steps, we could dramatically reduce our carbon footprint and help protect the environment. It is not a cliche; it is not silly nonsense talk. One person really can make a difference, and I hope that after my speech today, you will understand how. But first, what exactly is your carbon footprint? Basically, it's how much you pollute the environment as an individual, or rather, what volume of greenhouse gas is emitted into the atmosphere because of your day-to-day -day activities. The key to stopping global warming is for each of us to reduce our carbon footprint, and if we conserve energy in the home, we can achieve some truly dramatic results. Our homes are actually very inefficient from an energy conservation perspective. Indeed, more than 65% of all homes aren't insulated enough. This means that they lose heat, and that homeowners waste a lot of energy, not to mention money, on heating during winter. 
So, the first step is to fit adequate insulation in the attic and outer walls of your home. This can reduce your heating bills by as much as 25%. What's more, the government offers grants to people who want to have their homes re-insulated, so it isn't a very expensive process, and you will probably recoup your investment within a couple of years. I would encourage everyone to consider this course of action. Both your wallet and the environment will thank you. Believe it or not, there are even simpler things we can do. For a start, never paint your interior walls in dark colours. Dark colours absorb heat. Therefore, you will waste more energy trying to keep your home warm. Always use light colours on interior walls. Did you know a dishwasher that is 50% full uses almost the same energy as one that is 90% full? The moral of the story is to wait until your dishwasher is packed before switching it on. It'll save you and the environment. The same is true of most household appliances, so try to use them only when necessary. Another startling fact is that replacing just one normal light bulb with an energy-efficient light bulb will save you £25 over the lifetime of the bulb. Now, just imagine the savings if you replaced all the bulbs in your house. Having large windows seems to be in fashion right now, yet it makes no sense whatsoever from an energy-saving perspective. Windows are one of the biggest causes of heat loss. If you have large windows at home, my advice would be to close the curtains and blinds as often as possible. This will help your rooms retain heat. Another simple way to retain heat is to close all inside doors, especially ones which lead into cooler parts of the house. Carpets and rugs are great floor insulators. It's a good idea to have these fitted in rooms where heat retention is an issue. I would strongly advise people to consider erecting solar panels on their roofs. You don't need to live in a constantly sunny place to reap the benefits of these. Even our English weather will suffice. Solar panels can generate enough energy to heat your entire hot water supply, which is fantastic when you think how much you pay for this service at the moment. And of course, I would encourage people to continue recycling and composting waste. The next generation will thank us if we act now, and rightfully condemn us for failing to. Well, I can only hope you have found this speech informative, and that I have highlighted the importance of the individual to the cause of environmental protection. Thank you for your attention. I'll hand you back to Alice now. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.